It is a crisis that has affected Calais for years and goes to the heart of tensions between France and the United Kingdom. Six years ago, the jungle, the infamous migrant camp, was demolished by French police. More than half a decade later, the camp itself has gone, but the migrants and the smugglers who profit from them remain. In fact, they're reaching new highs with a record number of people attempting to cross the channel this August. Hello and welcome to France in Focus. This week we're in Calais and the English coastline is just about 40 kilometers behind me. And it is from here that every month, thousands of refugees and migrants head to the UK in the hope of a better life. Now, it's always a dangerous journey. Hundreds of people have died in the past two years alone. And it is the job of the French police to try and stop them heading off in the first place. As dawn breaks over the English Channel, these two police officers are already patrolling the skies above the coastline. They're scanning the dunes and the beaches for signs of people preparing to cross. Barely a few minutes into their flight, they spot something near Dunkirk. The police relay their exact location and take several photos. Ils sont en attente, mais ils n'ont pas le matériel. Et le but, c'est d'interpeller le passeur quand il va amener le matériel. Ils vont pas livrer un bateau alors qu'ils ont été localisés. On the ground, officers take over to stop the smuggler from reaching the migrants, thwarting another attempted crossing. But sometimes it's too late to stop them. Minutes later, police officers spot this boat in trouble, with roughly 40 people aboard. The motor has uh, stopped, they have managed to redémarrer, but that's important information. That means they have maybe an avarie motor. Et ils sont euh, en approche du chenal de Dunkerque euh, avec tous les ferries qui sont en attente de, dans la zone là-bas, notamment les portes conteneurs. They call in the Coast Guard. 06. A Navy frigate arrives. More often than not, these patrol ships let the migrants continue on their crossing. They only intervene to assist boats that have broken down. Day and night, the number of people trying to cross this summer has gone up thanks to favorable weather conditions. On one day alone in late August, almost 1,300 people made it to UK shores, according to British officials. For French police, it's becoming harder and harder to intercept the growing numbers of migrants and the networks of smugglers who organize their transit. Almost everywhere they look, they find evidence of a new crossing, like the sleeping bags in this bunker. Now they even have spotters. That means we have people keeping a lookout in the dunes who raise the alarm when we arrive. That's why we try being as discreet as possible. Even boats and equipment, which we used to track down in the day, are delivered barely minutes before an attempted crossing. Here in Calais, this Sudanese man has already tried crossing the channel at least once. It costs anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 euros. I come here, I take money for people. Uh, police, you come, you take the bottle. Once you can have chance today, you can go. Don't have chance, you can stay here. Yeah. Okay, you're waiting for a call from your yeah, smuggler? For my family. You take me money after uh, I pay, I go. Like others, he's determined to reach the UK by any means possible, but also to leave the dirty conditions of these camps located in and around Calais. NGOs say living conditions are unbearable. On this small square, local authorities put these rocks in place to stop humanitarian groups from handing out food and water. The people go even further and they have less water, they have less bread. If we knew how to welcome them properly, maybe they'd apply for asylum here. Today that's impossible. Already this year, the number of people who have crossed the channel has surpassed the total for all of 2021. Next, we head to Lille, a city about 100 kilometers from Calais, to visit a center offering shelter to those considering the journey, like Mohammed, who wants to be reunited with his brother in Edinburgh. Life is very hard in Calais, especially in the winter. People suffer a lot. It was very difficult in Sudan. I mean, 
There aren't actually any words to describe it. Mohammed is one of about 2,000 people supported by Sophie Jigo and her team. Sophie Jigo, thanks for talking to us today. You're an academic, an author, and you're also the founder of this organization, Migra Action 59. Start by telling us just a bit about what your organization does. It's a collective that we started in 2018, and it offers respite accommodation. Because in this region, we have a very specific situation where we have a lot of people who are in transit. They're not here to settle down. They want to get to England. They need to stop, rest for short periods of time. So with the help of host families, we accommodate these people for a weekend. I think it's often easy for people to think of migrants as a monolithic group, but of course they're not, are they? Everybody's different, their story is different. Tell me about some of the people who can't afford to pay the smugglers to go to the UK, and perhaps they've remained in France for years. What's life like for them? Yes, indeed. Uh, unfortunately, we're hosting people now who we had already housed temporarily in 2018 when we started this collective. Some of them are in very difficult situations. That has a really negative impact on these people. They've been broken down by the ordeal, these unsuccessful attempts to cross the border, and all the time they've spent in transit. The longer they stay here, the greater the investment is in time, energy and money, and that makes it even harder for them to give up. We also see individuals who are in very good health when they arrive arrived here become worn down by the experience. They develop certain disorders, and this life starts to damage them. That's why we started the collective. It's because we know that life in Calais can be draining, and we try to offer them a level of normality, of stability. Would you say that young men, who are the majority of people you see here, have a more difficult time than women and children? Women refugees are particularly invisible. They are in the camps, but we don't see them very much. That is an issue. As for the men, they perhaps experience more violence at the hands of the police, which can be very serious. And in Calais, yes, there is a majority of young men. You're right, because the living conditions here are so gruelling that the only people who stay are the ones who can physically bear it. Sont capables d'y résister, reste. And you talked about police violence. What does that look like? When we pick people up in Calais on Saturdays, they're wounded, bruised, black eyes, all the visible signs of the violence they've experienced. And then sometimes we hear accounts from people who are very surprised because they arrive in France thinking, well, we went through Libya, but now we're in the land of human rights. But in Calais, we're in what the right-wing mayor of Calais would like to turn into an experimental legislation area, that is, a, a zone where human rights are no longer guaranteed. How would you characterize the relationship here between the migrant communities and the French population at large? Are the relations good? Are there tensions? It varies a lot, because there are people who've been very welcoming in Calais, and it's been going on for 30 years. It's been quite difficult for Calais residents to deal with this. They can feel a bit abandoned, like they're dealing with the migrants on their own. Then there are others who take a more violent stance, because the fascist discourse exploits the presence of these migrants for electoral means, as we know. Marine Le Pen is the MP of Calais. Do you think that that has impacted some of the, the negative relations there? I'm not sure that the migrants know all that much about the inner workings of French politics. But beyond Marine Le Pen's discourse, which comes across as softer these days, some splinter groups have emerged here, with names like angry Calais residents or secular retaliation, who call on local people to, as they put it in vulgar language, beat up migrants. And that is dangerous. Sophie Gigo, thanks very much for talking to us today. Thank you. For decades, migrants here have been caught in the middle of a political battle between London and Paris. But Brexit and the British government's determination to, in its own words, take back control of its borders has only made the situation more fraught and more complex. Behind the pristine beauty of these wild beaches lie shattered dreams. On November 24, 2021, the English Channel saw its deadliest ever shipwreck. 
27 migrants, 17 men, 7 women and 3 children died off the coast of Calais as they tried to cross to England. On the scene, France's interior minister called for more international cooperation. The fight against illegal immigration will never succeed unless Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands and Great Britain tackle it together. We are perhaps not yet doing that enough. On the British side, Boris Johnson stressed his own desire for more collaboration with the EU. We have to work with our French friends, with our European partners. And I, I say to uh, our partners uh, across the channel, now is the time for us all uh, to step up, uh, to work together. But France and the UK have been working together on the problem for years. In February 2004, the Touquet Accords came into effect, allowing British and French officials to carry out immigration checks at each other's seaports. That followed the earlier Sangat Protocol, allowing for immigration checks at Eurostar train terminals. But the problem would soon deepen as a growing migration crisis pushed ever more people towards the French coast to attempt the crossing in small boats. Between 2009 and 2018, new accords were signed to reinforce border security, but Brexit would soon alter the legal landscape entirely. Suddenly, the UK could no longer send back migrants already registered in other European countries. Its migrant reception centers were quickly overwhelmed. The British government is under pressure to harden its position with regards to France, so that France intercepts and prevents these small craft from making the crossing. Some French politicians, though, say the British are playing a double game on migration to serve their own interests. Migrants are trying to cross because the British themselves are drawing them in. They've created a kind of magnet effect by not updating their laws in the 20 years since the Sangat Protocol. The reception conditions are still the same, sometimes even better, because they need this undocumented labor force for their shadow economy. So could the Touquet Accords be renegotiated? Legally speaking, yes. But the two parties would need to find agreement on a new protocol. And on that front, for now, no new progress looks possible. That's it for France in Focus. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you at the same time next week.